we're going to create a little hierarchy of classes. Um, um, and um, throughout doing that, we're going to first, the most important thing, review uh, what inclusion was in, uh, in OP244 and go through polymorphism and see how things work. And then we're going to add a few more things, like three, four, five touch-ups to it. Uh, if we have time left, we're going to start the templates. If we don't have time, the lecture continues during the lab. Okay? Uh, so, that's that. So, I already have all the, the files created for this. So, the modules are set. And I'm going to put everything in modules so later on you can walk through it and see how things actually work. We start by creating a class that I'm going to call it a figure. Essentially, it's going to be a geometric or figure that we're going to create. And uh, it's going to be a class um, figure. And we are going to create series of uh, things that we want to deal with it. Uh, we want we are we are focusing on the area that it covers. Therefore, we're going to have all the figures that we have will be able to find their own area, the area that they cover. If it's a square, it's side by side. If it's a rectangle, side height by. If it's a triangle, it's height by base divided by two. So things like that. And we are assuming that each object is capable of drawing itself. And also, uh, it could read its specs from the, from the input. And therefore, it can build itself over there. Um, obviously, because I am dealing with OStream over here, I'm going to include IOStream. But again, uh, as some of you who got the resubmission message from me, you're not supposed to have using command ever in a header file. Okay, a header file is not allowed to have using command in it, using namespace, whatever. It can never be in a header file. In a header file, if you are to use a certain specific, certain uh, definitions of it, as we have done over here, always qualify every and each object in it instead of actually use, it, use the thing using, okay? Using are done in CPP. Reason behind it is that if you actually put using that whatever inside a header file, anybody including that header file will start using the namespace without knowing it. Therefore, it gets open to all the names defined in that namespace, which is a very bad thing. You follow? Do we know why? It's a good quiz question for a quiz. Actually, I need to open that. Give me a second. So anytime you, anytime you create a class, it's a good idea to add a virtual destructor. Why is that? And why everybody's so quiet? Why always those people who answer or sit way apart, like either there or there. They don't sit, sit beside each other so I can come close. You were saying, and, and please use your opera voice, okay? Uh, destroyed fist, yeah. So it, it, in kindergarten terms, yeah. it prevents memory leak. It prevents memory. So when it's, if, if you ever are pointing a parent uh, if, if you're ever pointing a child using a parent and you delete the parent, virtual being destruct, destructor guarantees that uh, the latest one's going to get called first, right? Which means the destructor of the child's going to get called first, therefore everything's going to get wiped out. If your uh, destructor is not virtual, you're going to only delete the parent and the rest remains in memory, therefore you have memory. Okay, these are all reviews that we are doing one by one. Then, obviously, if I, when I have the read, 
these are the standard terms that we do read and write. There is not, no, nothing hidden behind this, like OP244 week three. And uh, definitely, if I want them to work with IO stream, I overload those two. Okay? And if I'm overloading those, I have to make sure that I have the. Names qualify. Are we good? Put this down to here. OK, implementing these things, we're going to go to the, um, this, def, the, what, what would you call this thing? Is this an interface, or it's, uh, or it's just an abstract base class? Or is it an abstract base class at all? Let's put it that way. D can you call this thing an abstract or a concrete class? It's an abstract base class because it has pure virtual and is it a, is it an abstract based class or is it an interface what is the difference an interface is a class that all the members are all, all the members are pure virtual all the so and it doesn't have any type of so this is an interface and that virtual destructor is just to guarantee that the if we could create uh, a pure virtual destructor, we would have. We can't. OK? That's why it's going this way. Um, so existence of these overloads doesn't mean that this is not an interface. This is an interface. OK? So essentially, uh, let me bring figure.cpp, <coughs> split it in two. And if you see, I am. Going bananas, please let me know, and I'm going to slow down. And uh, uh, at the end of the class, or anybody have difficulty seeing this? Better? Is it more than this, or it's OK? Is this OK? OK. Today is OK, but, but I, I um, really appreciate it for those who can't see. Like me, sit in front so you can see. So I can, the smaller I can make it, the more code I can have over there. Okay, and the screens are pretty small. So, anyways, so uh, so to implement those things, uh, uh, those guys, it's it's quite straightforward. Um, you know how it's done. Which is for the destructor, I simply. Uh, uh, create an empty struct, uh, destructor, and that's it. Uh, for the two uh, overloads, I'm going to have the IO stream. Here I can do using namespace STD. And I will create my operator overloads. Anybody have any problem with this? So essentially, without even having a definition of what, how draw and read work, I overload it. And why do I do that? Because by overloading this abstract base class, every single class that comes is going to implement read and draw. Therefore, because of polymorphism and the latest object being called and being virtual, I do not need to overload it anymore for any of his children. You follow this? OK? All right. So <clears throat> now that I have this uh, class created, um, I'll go to the next step. And I'm going to uh, create a triangle. Is something shaking? OK. <laughs> Somebody's. Seriously, what is this? Anyways. Anyway, so uh, let's, uh, let's continue with triangle. So we're going to create a triangle. So header files, let's put it at left. And the CPP files, we're going to put it right. So uh, triangle, the CPP comes at right. For a triangle, uh, I know that all triangles, they have a, a height and a base, right? 
So a triangle having a height and a base, um, I, uh, I actually create the, um, create the properties for it. So I have int height that is 0 and base that is 0. So I'm initializing them to 0. Simple and straightforward. And uh, I have enough information to calculate uh, the, the area. So I don't need to go any further than this. And I can actually read those information from the, from the entry too. But can I draw this? I can't draw this because I don't know it's a, what kind of a uh, triangle I'm dealing with over here. Is it a right triangle? What type of a triangle I have? Is it obtuse? Is it scaling? What type of triangle it is? I don't know, so I cannot draw it. Therefore, the class remains abstract. You follow down to this point? Are we okay? No? Okay. Let me, okay. Let me first implement those things and then we'll talk. Okay. So, uh, triangle, triangle, triangle. I have all the code. I could have brought everything up, but if I do that, it's going to be a mishmash of code over here, and I want you to see one by one getting built up. I don't want to just bring everything over here and show you that that's what it is. And if, uh, if I could type fast enough, believe me, I would rather actually to type it over here, but I didn't. Anyway, so, so essentially, this is what, what happens over here. So I, uh, <clears throat> I can, uh, the, through the area of a triangle, I can multiply it by base and divide it by 2, and that becomes the area of a triangle. If you don't know, that's how it's done. Okay. So, so I have enough information to do that. Okay. And because those are the two things that I need, that's that's how I'm, uh, that's my, how uh, what my abstractions lie lie. So I just need the area. I don't want to uh, do anything else. So that's what I'm getting. For reading, I can get those information, and my information is complete. But if I draw it, I don't know how should I draw that thing. Should I draw it like this? Never once in my life. Because the triangle is not final, I don't know what type of triangle I'm drawing. I cannot draw it, therefore I won't implement it. And that's that. And if we actually look at uh, the figure, we'll see that figure has read and draw. This one has read uh, and it doesn't have the draw. Therefore, it has an unimplemented pure virtual function because it has a pure virtual function, therefore, it becomes abstract. Are we okay now? Okay, so it's an abstract base class still, although it is inheriting from another one, but it's still abstract. Yes? One more time? Because I wrote the whole thing and I found it necessary. <laughs> well, the reason is that I didn't want to create accessors. If I wanted to create accessors, then it would the code will be more than this. I wanted to easily access it from the other triangle and set the values and get the values. And it was late at night. I didn't want to <laughs> write setters and getters or make it protected. Thank you for the question. I just want, <clears throat> I just want the height and the base to be accessible to the children. Okay? And that's another point. So I, it's a good thing. We have everything in here so we can see. What was, uh, so private, what, how did it work? Private, it, it's only accessible to the class itself. Children cannot access it. Protected is not accessible outside. Only the children can have access, right? So and that's, and that's what, what I'm doing over here. So, so for every single step that we have, this is just a thing. Uh, Control F7 is your friend in Visual Studio. One by one, compile and see if it actually compiles properly and go to the next step. Don't let it get bigger and bigger and then with 50 files, you start compiling, you get 9 million errors, and you just say, I'm not going to deal with this, and you close it down, and you go. Start from the beginning so you can pinpoint where, where things go wrong. And I'm compiling down to here. Oh, I'm getting error. Good. So triangle followed by double is illegal. Did you forget? What did I forget? Oh, uh, see, uh, that's a, another good thing, actually. 
when you have an error that doesn't make sense in your CPP file, always look at the header file that you included right before. I forgot to put a semicolon over there. Okay? Remember, errors happen where you actually, uh, where it hits first. Okay? So, essentially, if I did this, it wouldn't be an error. You follow what I'm saying? That shows what really, so if I compile it like this, oh, it actually did. It, oh, because it's before, I have to put after, yeah. So if I did this, sorry, that's what I meant. Then it shouldn't be error. See? Why? Because, again, include is nothing but copy and paste. Remember that. Include is nothing but copy and paste. Essentially, it copies this class over there, and a semicolon is added after, so it accepts it. Okay? Not that you should do that ever. Okay? <laughs> it should go where it's supposed to, but what I mean is that, that uh, I, I'm just putting the emphasis on finding error messages. When, when you find an error, you see an error in the CPP file, and it just doesn't make sense, go to the very uh, last uh, header file that you included right before and see if there's any boo-boo in there which it was in, case, in this case, okay? So that's that one. So now I have the triangle. Now what I'm going to do is to inherit, what, what did we do? What, where is the, uh, so let's go for a square now. So let's create a square. For this square, um, I can do everything that I want. I can have, um, first of all, the square of mine, unlike triangle, unlike triangle, the square of mine only needs a width, and that's it, and nothing else, right? And it can, uh, tell me what the area is, it can read and it can draw. It can do all those things with absolutely no problem. That's enough information to have a square printed, correct? So uh, we can simply do it. So I'm just going to put this stuff over there one by one. So where is my square? Read, draw. And area. There you go. And square.cpp. We have all those good stuff. And we need IO stream. And we need using namespace. STD. So essentially what I'm doing for printing, I'm just having two loops and printing asterisks to the size that we have. So if, if the width, whatever the width is, so width and height of the square, because uh, each line that you go, new line that you go, is actually size of two columns side by side, I print twice as much. So it actually looks like a square when it actually prints it. Otherwise it would be, uh, you know what I mean. That's why it's actually width multiplied by two. Um, so. Uh, and for reading, I simply say enter width, and I'm going to get the width and just return. Any problem down to here? Questions down to here? And to finalize the triangle, to actually make it something that I can actually work with, uh, let's create a right triangle because it's easy to print. <laughs> okay? So I'm actually doing, I'm assuming that I'm, I'm actually inheriting this triangle, the right triangle out of it. <coughs> For a right triangle, I do not need to add any type of uh, properties. I, need, I don't need to add any type of properties. Um, and I can draw it. And <clears throat> that's it. 
that finalizes the class, actually. That's the only thing that uh, a right triangle needs. And of course, it needs to in inherit the triangle. So include triangle. And include O3. All right. <clears throat> and the draw of that one, where is the triangle? We'll be right here. So um, <laughs> what a day. OK. Now we know the source of the shakings. Anyways, so <clears throat> all right. Now I have the draw. I have everything finalized with the triangle. I can write actually a piece of code to test it to see if this thing is actually working or not. Uh, let me compile it, make sure it's OK. So uh, uh, Control F7, this one. When I say Control F7, you know what I mean by Control F7. It's Control F7 essentially is compile. Do we have it anywhere? There you go, Control F7. OK, so that actually compiles it. Anyways, and uh, that's, how to, uh, that's how I'm drawing the, the, the right triangle, which is not important. So yeah, let's actually write uh, uh, a piece of tester to see if it's going to uh, run or not. I'm going to walk through it and see uh, how everything works. OK, so I'm going to create a square. Or right triangle. Oh, first let's add the so include square and include right triangle. So we're gonna have right triangle uh, RT and we're gonna have a square S and we're gonna say C out. Actually, let me put it over here instead of typing it. I have it. So this is what we're going to do. Now, seeing and see out in this IO stream that we have it up there. Now, uh, our T by itself, right triangle, has no implementation for uh, working with C in. Correct? And if I even do this, so if I go C out RT and C out S, there is no implementation for it. So just first uh, compile and run it. I want to see, make sure it works, and then I'm going to walk through it to see exactly uh, what we have done in here. So enter height base. So let's put over here, I don't know, 10 by 10. And the square, I'm going to put it 10. So there you go. That's there you go. So I have a I have a I have a triangle uh, that is uh, ten by ten uh, divided by two. That's fifty, and I have ten by ten hundred. That's the area of the of the square. So that's how that's how it's printed. Now let's go through it and see what we actually have done. So essentially, when CN is called, it goes. It says CN at left. At right side, it says right triangle. So essentially, it jumps to the first definition that you can have on that one. Because right triangle is essentially a figure, it goes over here and calls the figure. At left side, I have CN. At right side, I have a figure. Then it says figures, read is called. Because read is pure virtual, the latest version of read is called, that is the one that is in triangle, right triangle. So actually it jumps the right triangles and it's going to read it, which is going to be this. So essentially that, I don't know, five out of ten. And 
it enters, so that is entered. Did I hit enter? There we go. So it returns and comes back over here. And now it prints the, it wants to get the square. Again, goes into the exact same operator and says call the figure, but this time figure is a square. So essentially goes to the latest version of this one that is a square. Therefore, the square is read this call. And it will receive that one, that is five, and I hit enter. And then comes back over here, it says C out and RT. Again, goes the exact same way to the um, operator of uh, figure, calls the latest version, and that's the triangles draw. Which is going to be this one. Then goes down to the second one. So this ex essentially shows exactly how uh, pure rituals work. Are we okay with this? Very simple and straightforward, right? Okay? Are we okay? All right. All right. Next step. So out of this one, there we go. <clears throat> Let me just bring up the... I added a few stuff to the, to the figure to check and see if figure is same as other figure, to see if the area of one figure is bigger than the other one. And finally, line 11 is one of the most important things that we need to talk about, cloning. OK? What does it mean, and what is it good for? OK? So um, let me just bring this up. Now, now I can actually show the class diagram. Uh, new. It says it's already open. Hmm. Okay. There you go. That's much better. So, I, after the square, I added a rectangle over here, which adds a height to the, uh, to the width of the square, because it has width and height. That's something that, uh, um, uh, that is uh, worth talking about. There is this kind of a principle, the Liskov principle, that they say essentially what it says that when you inherit from an object and you want to work with the object that you had before, it has to be transparent and you should not need to be able to, you should not need to modify the specifications of the parent for the child to work. You follow what I'm saying? One more time. When you have a base class, you design a base class, and then you design a derived class out of it. When you are actually dealing with your derived class, and as you are implementing it through, the design should be done in a way that when you are doing the child, you shouldn't think that, okay, this is not going to work. I have to go change the parent for this thing to work. All right? And the example is in this uh, square and rectangle. Many times you see that the design is the other way, which means they say, okay, we have, what is a square? Square is a rectangle whose uh, uh, width and height are same, right? So if I actually do it this way, what's going to happen? If I actually design it the other way, which means first I create a rectangle with height and width, then I inherit the square out of it and start implementing it in a way that height and width are always the same. Then if I go back to my design, I'm going to get to the point that I have to think, 
oh my God, if I am designing it this way, will the height and width ever change? Will they be able to use the parents' methods and why change the square side, one get bigger than the other one? And so, because square in no way it has to change, right? You should never be able to make the side and width of the square to be different. If you design it the other way, then you have to go back and change the child, which screws everything up. Okay? Because of this fact, you have to always program like a chess player, which means when you actually are defining a child, I, have, I hate to say this, like because object orientation is essentially replicating the, new, the real world into your application, but sometimes you have to kind of not do that. Mathematically, whenever you are talking about a square, they always say a square is a rectangle with the both sides. They always say it that way. So if you go to mathematics, that's the way it's designed. So if you say, as an object-oriented programmer, I'm just going to replicate exactly what math says, and I'm going to bring it the other way. And when you do that, then your design is going to be flawed, and you're going to have problem. You have to go back, add restrictions to your original design to make sure that the square is accommodated when you are inheriting it. And that screws everything up. Okay, so you should always remember, you always keep in mind that if something is going to inherit, or if you know the hierarchy of in inheritance that you are going to develop, always think of the children that you are going to take to, to design later. See if their implementation requires the modifications of a parent. If that's the case, you have to do it the other way. All right? So that's something that you need to know. Another thing. Let's come here in May. All right. So when you add, take a look at uh, the figure over here. The figure says operator equal another figure, correct? If that is the case, if I have in my main something like this, if I have a rectangle being checked by a square, what can prevent me? How can I actually test this thing? Are they the same object? I know that like figures that I'm doing uh, in math, I need to be able to compare them to see if they're, if they're the same or not. But if I do something like that, I'm going to end up having two different objects at two sides of the, the operator over there. How can I fix that problem? Take a look at this. How can I even define what is the definition of a right triangle and a square being equal to each other? That doesn't make sense, does it? To implement that, to implement that, we have to do something like this. Where is the right track? Take a look at this. When you actually work in the hierarchy, in the polymorphism, in a way that you work in different branches of inheritance, which means you are dealing with your siblings. When I say sibling, this means two figures. At left side, I have one figure. At right side, I have another figure. And I want to compare the two. Because this figure is not only parent of, a, of in this case, triangle, but it could be a parent of a rectangle or parent of a square, I need to write the code in a way that it can work for all of them and can recognize what is what. That is when type ID comes to play. Okay? That is where type ID comes to play. Whenever I want to test and see an operation is happening between two objects or not, I want to see if it works or not, I can always check on the fly when I'm running the program to see if these two objects are of the same type or different one. In this case, in my main over here, when it's actually checking the rectangle and the square, when it comes down over here, 
the type ID of the current object that is rectangle and a type ID of the figure at right that is a square become two different things. Therefore, you can decide what to do if you want to accept it or not accept it. If, for example, you are just checking the area of the two, there is no problem. Continue. Find out what the area is and compare them. But if your business logic tells you that these two objects that are not of the same type cannot be compared, then you can actually enforce it using type ID. How? You simply say the type ID of mine, if it's the same as type ID of the other one, at right side, which means if these two are the same, because type ID of me, this, is a triangle, it means the figure that I'm receiving at right side is a triangle too. Therefore, I know it's a triangle pointed by figure. Therefore, I can upcast it. Am I making sense? Or I lost half of you? Or all of you? Okay. That's when this comes handy. Wait, where is it? This is a figure. This is a tri right triangle. This is a square, correct? When I have an operator over here that at left side accepts a triangle and right side of a figure, the figure that is coming in could be a right triangle or it could be other children of figure. It could be square or rectangle, correct? Right? If I actually find out that the figure that I'm receiving is right triangle, I can cast the pointer of that figure to a triangle because I know what is sitting up far there is a triangle. If what is sitting at the pointer of figure is not a triangle, casting it will cause a crash because at the end there is no triangle and I'm trying to cast to it. There are no methods in there. A triangle has two things. A square has only one element. So it's, it's not going to work out. You cannot cast an object to another type. It's impossible. Unless it's hierarchy of inheritance, you can always cast a parent to a child. You can do that. But if the object doesn't exist and it's of other type, you can't do it. It's impossible. I'm saying a person has come and marry you. It's a person, correct? Assuming you want to marry a lady, if I want to do this operation, I can upcast the person to a lady if the person is a lady. You follow what I'm saying? If the person that is coming in is not a lady, it cannot be cast, and then the marriage is not going to happen. So you have to always see what is, you have to identify what the target of polymorphism is to be able to see if cast is possible. Am I making sense? Let me walk through it. <laughs> Let me walk through it. Sorry, what can I do? I don't know what kind of example I can bring up for this thing. But let me just, uh, okay. Let me walk through it. Okay, so I have the right triangle, I have two squares, and I have a rectangle. So I have four different objects over here. I have one right triangle, two squares, and a rectangle, right? I am getting one by one all these things. Let me just come down right to here and get the information and just stop right there. So I'm just going to run the program. What did I do? Whoop. Okay, let me run it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, eight, uh, let's put four and eight. Four and eight. The square, I'm going to put uh, three. Um, another square, I'm going to put four. Uh, rectangle, I'm going to put. Uh, four and a, and a five. So height is four and width is five. Okay, and it's going to print them, okay? So that's my uh, 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 triangle, this is my square, and this is the second square, and this is, the, this is the rectangle, right? Are we okay with this? Now, let's come over here. Now it's saying if this, this uh, triangle 
is equal to that square. When I actually go to this thing, because the right side operator of right triangle is actually a figure, it will be called. C++ accepts that because it fits the category. They are both figures. It can work. But now that I'm there, can I really compare the two? One is a rectangle, one is a triangle, the other one is square. They have nothing to do with each other. I cannot do this comparison. Therefore, I have to check. I'm going to say, wait a minute. I know the two objects are figure, but are they the same type of figure? And type ID actually returns an integer that is the idea of that thing. If the two integers that are returned over there, values that are identical, it means the types are the same. You can actually print. It has a dot name too. You can actually print. Mm, I could do, let me just do this. I'm going to say over here, else, no if statement ever prints anything. No assignment operator, no comparison ever prints anything, but I'm doing it just to see what's going on. So I'm going to say C out uh, type I'm going to say type ID of name. is not the same as type ID of F. OK, now let's come over here again. Oh, that name. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, mm, let's run it one more time. All right, so it was 4 and 8, and I'm going to have over here 3. The other one was 4, and the other one was 4, no, no, four by 5, uh, height 4, and width 5, something like that. Um, so we're going to go right in here. And now, because the type IDs are not the same, it's going to come right to here, and it's going to and it's going to assume that it's false, and the message is going to be, Right triangle is not the same as the class square. So as you see, the name of the class is actually within that type ID. You can actually get the name. OK? So on the fly, in your program, when it's running, it can identify what the type of the thing is. And the type ID is as a polymorph thing, too. Depending on what type of a class you're dealing with, it's, it's, it literally is going to call that one. So now it's going to return false. And because it's returning false, um, it's going to say not the same. Okay? Now it's checking a, a square with a, what is T? Oh, well, they're both square because they're both square. Uh, the squares are different with following width. So it actually, um, sorry, I should have gone into it. <laughs> uh, it actually finds that, so it actually returns false, but it knows they're both squares. This is, this is what the code was. So it actually finds out they are the same, and then uh, it upcasts the, the, the figure to a square and puts the address in RT. So RT actually now is accessible. I can actually access the width of it and extract the width out of it if I want to. Now I know there is a method called width over there. If it was a triangle, it, it, there was no method width because now it's a square, I know I can call it, and, it, and I compare the two, and it returns it out. And, and that's that. So it's going to say not same. Where was I? Is it running something away from me? Oh, no, it's at the end. Anyways, so let's, uh, let's take a look at it. I just want to make sure that. Uh, Everything's good in here before I talk about the next thing. Or maybe uh, if you want a break. You want a break? Okay. Okay, pause. What I just explained about the equality operator is a business decision. It's a business logic decision. It's the logic of your program's decision to get implemented this way. Take a look at the... Take a look at the, where's the header file? 
where take a look at the we have an operator greater than you know what that operator does it checks to see if the area covered by this figure is bigger than the other one if I go to the implementation of this one Forget about this clone thingy. Remove, forget about that. It can simply be implemented like this. Do I need to check for a type ID? No. Because the business logic over here says compare the areas. And because area is a pure virtual function in a figure that is implemented in all children, there is no need to check the ID. I can compare a square and a triangle, see which one is covering more space. It has nothing to do with what they look like. Therefore, I don't need to check the ID. I don't need to check to see if they are the same type or not. Again, what I told you is not a must. It's the need. You have to think, do I need, can I do this comparison logically? If I'm comparing to see if two shapes are the same, I, if it's two rectangles, I have to make sure that the width and the height are the same. If it's a triangle, I have to do a height and a base and make sure that whatever the, the many other things are the same. It's, not, it's very difficult. Like, and the square, I only need to check the weight. So the, the, the way of comparison is completely different. Because of that fact, I have to check the ID and compare it accordingly. But when I'm checking for the area being covered, I have no need to do it whatsoever. You can just use the area, and it works perfectly, as you see. Do we understand what was the reason for that type ID thingy and upcasting? All right? The reason I needed to upcast, the needed reason that I need to upcast the figure that is coming into a right triangle so I can have access to base and height. A figure doesn't have base and height. A square doesn't have base and height. A rectangle doesn't have base and height. To be able to refer to them, I need to have a pointer to a right triangle. Otherwise, I can't do it. Because of that, I upcasted it using dynamic cast, the figure to the right triangle that it is. I know it is a right triangle. I just tested the ID. Therefore, I'm doing the casting. If I didn't do the, the, the ID check, I couldn't cast because I'm not sure who's sitting at the target. I have to make sure what it is before I can do it. Somebody calls Kim. You pick up the phone or you're talking, you cannot refer to she or him, or he or she, because you don't know who is the target. You have to first identify if Kim is a lady or Kim is a gentleman. After knowing it, you can refer as he or she. That's what it is here. But if you know it is a lady that you're talking, then you can actually call her a she with confidence. You know no error is going to happen, no embarrassment is going to be there. You follow what I'm saying? That's all. So that's the type ID over here, and that's what it is. That's only you. That's what it is. Next thing that I wanted to tell you, cloning. The example that we have over there is copying. Okay? Uh, why do we need to have cloning? Most of the, I'll tell you first what cloning is. Each object has, like if, if we go to, and this is very usual, uh, we do it all the time. Let's go to a figure. As you see, I'm creating a pure virtual method called clone that returns a pointer to a figure. OK? Clone is a pure virtual function that returns a pointer to a figure. What does it do? At any concrete class, in any concrete class, what is a concrete class? Again, a concrete class is a class that? It's fully implemented, you can instantiate it, right? If it is in any concrete class, I implement that clone thingy, and I make it instantiate 
an instance of itself and return it. How? Like this, you see? Of course, this cloning, I don't have a copy constructor, but I could have actually set a copy constructor in here. So essentially, I have to say new uh, and put over here this. So essentially, create a new right triangle out of myself and return it. Why do I do this? Why do I do this? Reason is this. Let me first fix these things because uh, I have a uh, few of these clones and I did not actually uh, uh, recall the copy constructor over here. Uh, clone, let me go to one by one. CPP triangle doesn't have it. S uh, rectangle does have clone. So that's this. And square has clone. And right triangle has. So if you compare the codes between the two, if you compare the codes between the two, so if you look at the clone of a square and a clone of a a right triangle. They are both clones. They are both returning a figure pointer, correct? But one is returning an object of type square. The other one is returning an object of type right triangle. Right? Are we okay with this? Therefore, it is guaranteed, now listen to me carefully, it is guaranteed that if the clone of any object is called using the parent's pointer, automatically the proper copy of that object will be returned. If I wanted to, for example, if for some reason, if for some reason I needed to modify this figure before I do anything with it, do the comparison, and because it's constant, I cannot change it, right? Let's say to be, to, 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 to be able to, this compare, to do this comparison, I need to modify the figure. If I wanted to do that, how could I do it? It's impossible, right? Because it's constant, I can't do it. So I need to make a copy out of it, correct? And in here, I have to say, because it's a right triangle, I have to say, I have to say uh, right triangle pointer RT is equal to new what? I cannot, that's the thing, because it's a, fi sorry, not right triangle, figure. I cannot put anything in here because I don't know what is the object that is coming in is what. I don't know what is the type of an object. How do I instantiate a new copy out of it? If I am in need of copying this figure, what do I, how do I know what it is? It's impossible, correct? But having the clone, all I need to do over here is to say, is set to f.clone. And because the latest version of the clone will be called, whatever the object is, it's going to create an instance of itself and return. So the proper copying is going to happen. That's why we have this clone, this clone thing in most of the templates that you see out there. So anytime you want to make a copy of something and you don't know what is the type, try checking to see if they have a clone method. Okay? 99% you'll find one. And it's a good idea to have it. It doesn't, it's not so many lines of programming. It's just one clone thingy you write and you just return an object. If it's, a, if it's an abstract based class, if it's a virtual class, create one. It, it comes handy. Yeah. Pardon me? You don't need to. Clone is using it. Clone is using the copy constructor to copy itself. Because we don't know what F is, we cannot do any copying, right? When the clone is called over here, if the clone is a square, it's going to call the square and call the copy constructor of itself and return a new one. If it's a rectangle, it's going to call a copy constructor of a rectangle. 
If it's a if it's a whatever it is, it's got to call the proper one. So we cannot copy the like. copying a figure doesn't make sense even. <laughs> it's an abstract based class. It's like doesn't doesn't exist. You need to have a con you need a concrete object to 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 copy it. You cannot copy an idea, right? Yes. No, it's just make it's just making new a copy. It's a copy. Yeah, yeah, you can. There are so many use cases that are out there. When the time comes, you'll find out that you need it. When you want to, especially when you are dealing with templates and polymorphism, you are always dealing with pointers and references of parents pointing to children. And that's one of the reasons we have the auto thingy over there, the auto variable because many times you want to create an instance of something you can't simply find it you don't know what the type is it's literally difficult impossible to find through the logic what you're dealing with and when you want to copy something it becomes impossible to know what it is and the clone is the the, the best way of doing so that's uh, that's one of the things that's the thing that I that I needed to say so in uh, here, it's actually explaining it with a copy function. Where is it? There was this type of dynamic type identification was optional, but it's not. It's something very important for you to know. That's why I said it. I'm sorry. It's uh, mm, I don't know where it is. Go read this thing, and it's some. So, uh, there we go. The clone is here. So probably the copy. There we go. So it says if you want to. It's using shape here. Okay. So it says if you want to copy a shape, you don't know how to do a copy. Okay. Because you don't know what is the what is the uh, the final thing that this shape is pointing to. Therefore, it is telling you to create a the clone uh, and each clone sends the uh, proper copy of the target anyways go through those things and you'll know uh, for the templates <clears throat> uh, Extremely important thing about templates that is usually that usually causes a mistake. First of all, you know, temp uh, when you templates are essentially. Let's first make it clear what a template is. A template, a one up, is a one up B type of a code, which means a template that you create. You're actually telling the compiler how to write the code for you, if request it when you create a template when you create a template these are all op244 stuff when you create a template no code will be added to your executable if the template is not called if it's not requested so essentially what you do you create your code a code that is general and you know for different types you're going to need this. Like you want to create an array. You want to create a linked list. You want to create anything that applies to different types of types. You write your logic. The places that the type is going to only change, you put a placeholder instead. Then in your code, you call that logic and make it known to compiler, I want that logic with an integer type. I want that logic with an employee type. I want that logic with a double type. Compiler looks at the pattern of the logic you have written, replaces the types you have written with the new type that you want, generates the code, adds it as a new thing to your, to, to your source code. So if you have a template of a sort written, if you call the sort for an integer double an employee, actually it creates three different functions for you with three different signatures. One for an integer, one for a double, one for an employee. 
It literally generates it at compile time and adds it to your executable. That is why all the templates must exist entirely in a header file. You cannot have a CPP file and a header file. You cannot have a module for a template. Why? Because when the compiler sees request to generate code out of a template, if half of it is in a header file, the other half of a CPP file, it won't have access to the logic and the CPP file part of it. Therefore, it cannot generate the code. It needs to have access to the whole logic. That's why the, the templates entirely exist in header files. You cannot put it in a CPP file. Class, functions, methods, everything goes into a header file. When you write a template, there is one important rule about writing a template. The template signature that you write only applies to the scope that comes next. What is the definition of a scope? Either an open curly bracket that comes right after whatever the template is, or a single line. In this case, I have, you see it says template t, t value. So this template only applies to this and nothing else. If you have a class, it's going to go right to the end of the scope of a class. If you have another function created after the class, you have to add another template tag to it. If you have 50 functions, you need 50 template tags for every single scope that you have over there. Remember, okay, that's extremely important. Function templates are always recognized by the signature of the function, which means when you actually create a template, like was just the swap that you see over here, it actually, you are actually telling T is the one that I want it to be replaced when the function is created. So if somebody calls swap with two integers, because the signature of the swap says swap int int, the T is replaced by an int, the function is generated at compile time, now it can be used. If you say swap double double, then it's going to actually create it with two doubles and so on and so forth. Again, because template is written right beside the function, this is where it ends. If the template is supposed to continue and it's three functions that work uh, with each other, you have to have one template signature for every single function separately. You cannot have it one for all. When templates are written, obviously they cannot match every criteria of the uh, types that you have. If you are, for example, doing comparison between objects, it works with all the things that less than and greater than sign is defined. But if you want to compare two characters, C character strings, it won't work for it. Because that's not less than or greater than, you have to do string compare, right? Whenever the logic you are writing have few exceptions, you can actually write separate functions just to cover the exceptions. And this is how it's done. So, for example, in here it's doing maximum, right? So it says I have a template for t maximum that finds the biggest of two and returns it, right? Because that's the case I'm doing, if I want that to work for a character pointer string, for a C style string, it's not going to work. Because the comparison, this, won't work for a string. Therefore, I have to write a separate function that works just for that. And the syntax for it will be, because it's specialization, you just write a template and greater than less than with no placeholders in there. And instead, you put the absolute signature of the function by adding the type it wants to use right after the name of the function. So you write the function normally, and then you write what is this function written for. Therefore, in all other cases, the template is going to be used as this one, but for character pointer, it's going to be used as this one. And this is specialization for every single uh, function that you have, or it could be for class or whatever you want. Yeah.
usually when as a startup person who's who, who just learned how to work with templates usually you write your logic using a primitive type and after you finish you sit back and you look at what needs to be replaced and you replace it and convert it to a template but as time passes you become so expert that you can do that stage in your brain which means you start writing a template right out of that out of that and that's not a difficult thing to do Yes. It is a template. You see that template thing at the back? You see that template? This? You see this? This says, this is a template. This says that is the name of the template, which is a match to that one. Okay? And this one says, that's the type that activates this logic in this template. It's 100% it's distinguishable. The, so why, by writing template, first you are saying this function, this is a specialization for a template. Which one? The one that is called maximum, that accepts two arguments. And I want this to get activated if these two types that are passed are character pointers. So essentially, by that specialization in front of the name, you're actually telling to the compiler explicitly, I want that to be called. All right? There we go. In here, D and E, as you see, are character pointers, right? Because they are character pointers, automatically they trigger this one. As simple as that. If there is anything but that, it goes to the original one. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Specialization entirely replaces the logic with a new one. You can have anything you want in here completely different with what it was up there. You don't have to follow the same logic. Of course, you follow the logic that implies finding the maximum of two things in this case. But you do it any way you want. It doesn't have to be the same way. Did I answer the question? Yeah, but you have to have specific... Spe Let's say I want maximum to be different for comparing two cars. Let's say you have a class called car and you want the maximum to be different for two cars because maximum for you is the size of the engine. If that's the case, then you're going to write over there T, not T, car, reference, or car, maximum, then in braces you put car, so this will be car and car A, car B, which means if they if maximum was ever receiving two cars, use this logic instead of that. And you can repeat this over and over as many times as you want. You can have so many. But of course, if you have 50 specialization and a template that only applies to three types, they just write the functions. <laughs> the whole point of templates is actually write the logic that is being reused many times. When you find out your template has more specialization than it's used, just write the functions and be done with it. <laughs> you don't need a template. You need a class. You need a toolbox for that. OK? Um, OK? Are, are we OK down to here? Unlike, unlike functions, Classes don't have signature. Unlike functions, classes don't have signatures. When you have a function from a signature, from the signature of the function, the compiler can identify what the template is and which one is supposed to be called, or a template is present at all or not. But from a class, it's absolutely impossible. The array class that we have in here, you see what it is. If it's converted to a template to be array of anything, 
is impossible to get created because it doesn't have a signature. That's why class templates always follow the signature of the template in front of them. And you are using it right already in dynamic cast and static cast and all those things. Template libraries, the standard template already is so vast that it's got to be something very norm for you to see. So essentially, the beginning says what the logic is, and this one says what I want the logic to be built for. So I want an array to be built for long types. Okay? You can always pass regular things to a template to build it if you want to. Although you can pass types to build it for certain type, but you can pass the uh, regular values to it if you want to. That has to be an integer. The, the uh, conditions of uh, the non-template uh, types are here. An integral, it cannot be floating point, so the, what you're passing to a template cannot be a double or a float. It cannot be that. It could be pointer to an object. It could be an L value. It could be L value. It means a reference, not a move reference, okay? It, ha it has to be a reference, a pointer to a member. It could be null pointer or auto. So these are the things that you can pass as a, as a second parameter or third or fourth, as long as it's a non-templated thing. So non-templated uh, uh, arguments uh, are called that way. And one thing I forgot to mention, sometimes when you are doing templates, the types are too close and a compiler cannot recognize which one is what. You create a template for an integer and a template for a long. Then you call the function with two integers over there. Compiler doesn't know which one to call. If that's the case, you can simply specially call any template by adding the signature of the template to the beginning of the function. That's explicit call for templates. I think we had it somewhere. There you go. You see? So even if the, like your function is a template, but just to force which template to get created for a function, you can actually add the signature of the template to the function. There is no problem with that. You can do it. Okay? So, again, if you create templates that the compiler couldn't find out, it's in a hierarchy of polymorphism. You're, you're writing a template that accepts a figure and you want to have a triangle and a, uh, you want to have a square in it and a, and a rectangle. And then, the compiler doesn't know which one to call because they are within the same hierarchy of inheritance. If that's the case, no problem. Just write what you want and that one's going to get called for you. Oh, pardon me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, so essentially you are saying, I want the maximum build to be double and A and B passed to it. So you are saying, because compiler cannot distinguish which one is float and which one is double. Float and double are the same, right? Because it cannot distinguish which one to call, you say, don't worry, call the float for this one, call the double for that one. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you do it. Take it off and put it over there. You'll see that's going to say I, ambiguous call. I don't know which one to create. Okay? Or it might create it and create the wrong one for you. <laughs> and you'll see it's not, it's, it's, not call, it's not actually calling the one that you want. Seven more minutes. I think I can uh, get over with it. So, yeah, so you can, you can pass non-template types to something. So if you want the array to get created, so essentially when you want the array to get created, you want to have an initial size for it. So, uh, or you want to create specific types with specific initial values, depending on what type of a type you are passing to it. You can simply pass a second argument as a regular uh, uh, non-type uh, parameter, and it's going to accept it. So essentially you are saying create an integer array with 50. So, or create a double array with 50. Create an employee array with 5. So essentially this 5 is going to get passed and uh, inserted into the template, but with a specific type. Okay? So that's it. The difference is that class and type name are types that are being replaced, 
Non-template parameters are values that are being replaced. You have to appreciate that, OK? You cannot put 5 for t. 5 is not a type, OK? Employee is a type. Table is a type. Double is a type. Class, any type of class is a type. But when you say in size, it has to be only an integer. If a template is mostly used with specific type, exactly like a function, you can put a default value for its arguments. If I don't mention, it's an integer with 50. OK? Exactly like that one. So you just, but you have to mention that this is a template. But don't put anything in it. Kind of defies the purpose. I don't know why. But anyways, <laughs> if it's needed, you can do it that way. Class variables. I already mentioned it in the last class. What is a class variable? A class variable is a static member variable that you have or a static member function that you have. OK? Static member variables and static member functions are created for all instances of that thing. OK? Are created for all instances of that thing, not only for that particular, not for individual objects. So one is getting created and all the objects are using it. When creating for a template, the meaning of all, all objects becomes completely different. If I want to have a static value for, for example, this array thingy that it has over there, I don't know if that static unsigned count is for double arrays or for integer arrays or for employee arrays. So I have to specifically mention which one this has to get created. That's why they are instantiated outside with an exact same signature template of the template that is originally created up there. So if you are having a static member variable, initialize that one using the exact same template signature. So for every template that is creating, it is creating a separate static value for it so it can be used for those. Therefore, double arrays will have count of their own. Integer arrays will have the count of their own, and so on and so forth. Are we OK? Don't even go there. We don't want to talk about that. Anybody knows printf and scanf, how they work? How many people know how printf and scanf are written? How can you pass five arguments or two arguments to printf? Nobody ever asked? You never asked yourself? What, was, what is a prototype of printf? No? OK. So I'm not going to teach this. Because <laughs> it's almost the same concept, but it's OK. Anyways, uh, uh, I didn't teach templates. I don't consider this teaching. It's just, I just went through it. OK? I'm going to come up with some examples and bring it during the lab so you can do your lab. <laughs> but it's essentially the same thing. It's, uh, it's the same thing that you did in OP244. Okay? Anyways, have a beautiful day.